because she has the microphone. So that's why we're so close. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you for coming today to the final talk um, in Theodore Payne's Latuna Canyon Regeneration Series. Um, after the first fire that was in the first days of September, we opted to um, organize a series of presentations for our community on fire ecology um, and how to protect your home and your garden and prepare. Um, and what to expect as the canyon regenerates. Um, our big emphasis has been on doing nothing in the wild areas because there is a seed bank there that is waiting to come up um, that only comes up after a fire, so we're going to see beautiful, remarkable things happen. Um, and the human beings just need to trust that nature has this all taken care of because she's been doing it for a few million years, and we need to let it be, and, um, and things will recover. Um, so, Sabrina um, Drill is here to give the last talk. Um, before I set it over to her, um, I want to tell you there's some great handouts up on the table, but also um, I want to let you know about an effort that we are organizing um, to do monitoring of the regrowth in Latuna Canyon when it starts. Knock on wood, we're going to get some rain, so this will happen. Um, and what we're going to do, we don't know exactly the parameters of it, um, but what we will do is be, go out with scientists, biologists, um, probably a little bit with Jordan, uh, who is our director of, uh, uh, our production director, who has a background in restoration and botany, and go out there as the things start coming back and see the regrowth and monitor it for science to, to get some records on this. And Sabrina is going to talk to us about protocols that will be used statewide, so this can be information that can be gathered and shared with other entities that are doing the monitoring. So if you're interested in doing that, there's a sign-up sheet here. And for those of you that are watching on our live stream on Facebook, or you will be watching this later if you're, uh, if you're picking it up on our YouTube channel, where all of the talks are available for viewing, um, then just give us a call at Theodore Payne, um, or send us an email, and we'll add you to the list. And as the um, efforts are organized, we'll get in touch with you so you can come out. We don't know exactly how often we're going to do it. We are going to be going on marked trails um, with professionals. We're not just going to be walking all over the hills. And we're going to do some really good um, collection of information as the regrowth and regeneration takes place. Um, so we are very hopeful and have optimism that nature will take care of this. Um, and for all of you that are here that have suffered um, and maybe still are suffering from the effects of the fire, our hearts go out to you. Sabrina lives in Ventura, so she was just sharing that her child hasn't gone to school for two weeks and hasn't been able to go outside. So um, these are the things that a lot of people are facing. Fortunately, the Creek Fire, the second one in our area around Theodore Payne, is 100% contained. Um, so, but this is, uh, it's not the end. So it's the beginning and um, we hope that you will gather lots of information. And for those of you that are watching, I will repeat that all of the talks, uh, there were seven talks and then a half day workshop with uh, six different speakers. Um, we hope that you will watch them on our YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and type in Theodore Payne Foundation, click on the little picture of our sign that's out in our parking lot, and you'll get specifically to the ones that we have posted. Um, so without further ado, Sabrina is going to talk about some really important things. Thank you all for coming today and enjoy the lecture. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sabrina Drill and I'm the Natural Resources Advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Los Angeles and Ventura counties. Um, I'm also the Associate Director of the California Naturalist Program, and so some of the things that can be talked about in terms of um, volunteer monitoring with Theodore Payne, we're hoping that we'll also be able to sort of replicate similar protocols around the state um, with our California Naturalist partners as well. So excited to work on that. Um, I will also say from the outset that I'm a fish biologist. And so plants are not necessarily my forte, but the reason that I really got interested in looking at invasive species, and I'll talk both about invasive plants and about insect pests a bit today um, that affect native, native trees primarily. Um, the reason I got interested in that is because of the impacts that they have on our watersheds, on our streams, and on our wildlife and aquatic um, fauna. So, um, with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that I started in, I think it was 2008, 
um, called Safe Landscapes, and that stands for Sustainable and Fire Safe Landscapes. We did a lot of work at the time to develop um, calendars and guidebooks and a website that have information that sort of crosses this boundary between talking about fire and talking about invasive plants, because in Southern California, the two are really, really intimately linked, and I'll talk about ways in which that happens today. I will also say that while um, I um, ascribe to a lot of what Lily said um, at the beginning about kind of letting nature take its course, I will say that the reason that I sort of subtitled this talk Tipping the Scales today is because while our um, Mediterranean ecosystems and our chaparral habitats in Southern California are adapted to recover from fire, all kinds of human interactions have made that, have, have sort of disturbed that process and have um, um, kind of put a wrench into the gears of these natural cycles that should happen. And invasive plants are one of those. So one of the things that we do often need to do post-fire to allow the native plants to recover is to think about getting out there and controlling invasive plants at the same time. So again, I'm going to talk about where the interactions are between invasive species and fire at sort of several critical um, um, intervention points today. And this is not on. And I will turn it on. <laughs> oh, it does have the thing in there. It should work. The remote's not working. Uh, you know what, I think what's going on is the mouse is in here, and I think I'm going to have to pull the mouse to put this in. Yeah, okay. I learned the hard way. I also want to apologize that um, I had hoped to watch all of the previous speakers' presentations, but um, things have been a little crazy the last couple weeks. They were crazy before that for other reasons, so... Um, um, I may be repeating some of the same things that other speakers have said. I may be saying the opposite of what some other speakers have said. Hopefully not. Um, John and I work pretty closely together and some of the other speakers that you've seen before. So um, bear with me if I do that. But of course, I don't know if all of you have attended all of the other lectures anyway. So repetition can always be somewhat good and still not happening. Oh, future. I turned it on. You know what I would be perfectly happy to do, though? Oh. Oh. So I don't know if the mouse is going to work now because we may have taken out the mouse <laughs> connector. Oh, it is. Okay. Uh, it's a big it bounce. seems like it's not in the... Um, it's not in a PowerPoint mode right now, it's in a computer mode. There we go, okay. Yay. So, <laughs> SAFE was sort of the acronym that I tried to come up with, so it would be a little bit catchy, um, for sustainable and fire safe. And certainly what we were really interested in is um, improving fire safety and preparedness in these wildland and urban interface areas to protect all of you, to protect um, your homes and your property, but also to think about how we can protect both from wildfire, but also from all of these other impacts, the neighboring habitat, and again, um, fauna and flora. Um, fire is a natural part of ecosystems in Southern California. I'm, I'm sure Rick uh, talks a little bit about, you know, how there's a lot of misunderstanding about the length of natural fire cycles and the return frequencies and what is considered mature for these kinds of habitat. But regardless of any of that, there's no doubt that fires will occur. The other thing that there's really no doubt about is that um, our fires in Southern California are, are occurring more frequently than they should have naturally because of um, um, uh, human-induced <coughs> ignition, primarily. So we have very few lightning-sparked fires in Southern California. That's something you see in other parts of the state. So almost all of our large wildfires come back, not necessarily to arson, but some kind of human intervention, be it sparks from a car, a cigarette butt, a campfire getting out of control, um, whatever it may be. Um, 
The other thing that we know is that fires can occur at any time of year and have. And when I worked on this project back in 2009, we did a little chronology of fires, and we really saw, you know, this uptick in fires. Fire season usually peaks in October, November, um, in the LA area. But you know, the fire season is lengthening, and whether it's even relevant to talk about fire season anymore, we'll see. We'll see what happens this year. Um, these December fires are a little, a little crazy. So, you know, what, is, what do we need for fire to happen? So there's two fire triangles that I usually think about. One is just sort of the physics of fire. What does fire need to burn? It needs fuel, heat, oxygen. But when you think about fire behavior in a wildland landscape, whether it's forest or not, it, what really drives the fire behavior is, again, the weather, the topography, but also, once again, the fuel. And of all of these, what can we change? The fuel. And that's where it's possible for us to have some kind of effect, whether positive or negative, primarily. We, could, we may be changing the um, weather as well, certainly, but that's, that's an issue for another talk. <clears throat> um, just some terms, what we're talking about here, the wildland urban interface is, you know, where human development comes it up into wildlands, and in Southern California in particular, this is a really complicated interface, right? Basically, if it's flat, we're going to build on it. Um, and that leads to these kinds of maps of fire hazard severity zones um, throughout the county, basically anywhere where you have foothills, you're going to have a high fire hazard severity zone. And usually, these are the areas where you still retain a lot of wildland as well, again, because they're not the areas that are easy to develop. What are some of the issues in wildland fire that we're thinking about in fire science today? Um, a lot of what we talk about is changes in fire regime. I mentioned human caused ignitions. In some areas, fire suppression has probably allowed a somewhat unnatural buildup of fuels that allows fires to be larger to happen at different times of the year. This really isn't the issue that we're facing in Southern California, though. From the state as a whole, the buildup of, say, fuels because of all of the um, drought-related and then insect-related tree dieback in the Sierras is definitely something we need to deal with. Fuel reduction at a large scale level can help us control where fires occur here, but it's probably not the primary, like, fire suppression isn't the action that's causing the problems that we're seeing today. Um, what can we do in terms of fuels management? Well, there can be selective thinning to protect, and it shouldn't just say natural resources, human resources as well. What fire um, agencies usually for, refer to as assets at risk or values at risk. Um, um, and there's a lot of changes in the vegetation that occur when you have these kinds of selective thinning. But even more so if you have this broad scale brush clearance. Brush clearance is a terrible, terrible term. It's a terrible term for two reasons. We're not usually talking about brush and we're not usually advocating clearance, but we still use that term. And I'll talk more about some of the problems if, if that's your approach, if that's what you come to it with. Brush clearance, some of the problems that, that can lead to, not just in terms of environmental impacts, but in terms of actually creating higher fire risk when your intent was to reduce it. Um, and then, certainly, invasive species, which is where I'm going to focus today. So just briefly, I always like to define invasive species for people. I know if you guys are involved with Theodore Payne, you probably have a sense of the value of using um, native plants in your landscapes. But one of the things that people tend to be somewhat confused about when we talk about invasive species, there's, there's a misunderstanding in that realm between native, non-native, and invasive. And it turns out that it's really only a small subset of non-native plants or non-native species that are invasive because to be invasive, by legal definition, they have to cause harm. 
can be harm to the environment, it can be harm to um, economically important resources, it can be harm to human health. But if they're just out there sort of growing slowly in somebody's garden, say roses for example, that tend to not be particularly invasive, it, it's, it's a little bit neutral. And I'll let you guys at Theodore Payne sort of take on that battle of trying to get everybody to use natives. I'm much more focused on trying to just get them not to use invasives. Um, so, it's not just plants, um, it can be um, diseases, West Nile virus is a kind of invasive species, um, um, predators, competitors. Um, one of the things that we see is that, especially for plants, they tend to be things that are coming from similar climates because if you're utilizing plant material that requires a lot of um, supplemental water, they're not going to do well on our dry hillsides, right? It's the plants that do really well in dry climates that can cause the most harm as invasives. And unfortunately, these are the same plants that sometimes people choose for a drought tolerant landscape. So you have to be really careful about those things that are coming from other Mediterranean climates like South, you know, South America, um, South Africa, Israel, the Mediterranean region itself. That's where a lot of our invasive species come from. They can be favored by ecosystem um, changes and especially climate changes. So one of the things I deal with in rivers um, are, um, let's say, a system like the LA River um, it's full of bass and carp and mosquito fish. These are all species from um, much warmer climates and the water temperature in the LA River is really elevated for many, many reasons and I'm not going to digress into that right now. But um, again, if you're changing the climate, you're not um, exposing the native species to what they are evolved for and adapted to and you may be sort of disfavoring them and favoring these other species that come in. They also tend to be things that grow really fast, really weedy, have high reproductive rates, and they may have a very short um, life cycle, actually, where they get out, germinate, again, I'm going back and forth between plants and animals, but for plants, you know, get out, germinate, grow up really fast, then die back and set seed, and that has some other impacts. And even if you're not interested in the environment, they're really expensive. It's costing a lot of money. This is actually, again, not a plant um, thing here, but does anybody know what this might be? Barnacle? Zebra mussels? Quagga mussels, very close. So these are quagga mussels in, from Lake Mead growing over a boat propeller. Um, and they um, really muck up all of the irrigation infrastructure. So they're like, even just to the point of, you try to close those dam gates now, and it's just like <laughs> it's just covered with these mussels. So they're costing a lot of money, and they're damaging a lot of our threatened and endangered species. Okay, I started to talk about this a little bit. What makes the species really prone to being good at being an invader? It's those species that do well under a lot of um, climatic. Um, they're they have a really broad um, habitat range, right? They're not super specialized. They can, they can grow anywhere and do fine. Often a short generation time, often very disturbance adapted. And again, we'll talk about fire as a major landscape disturbance, leaving bare ground with these, where these weedy plants can really um, take over really well. And then, as I mentioned, adapted to the local local uh, climatic conditions. So, you know, you'll see a lot of times our feather grasses, fountain grasses, pompous grass are good examples <coughs> of those that are also not great from a fire perspective. What kind of problems do they cause? They displace native plants and degrade habitat. They can degrade recreation areas. And they can increase um, biomass, but it's really the continuity of the fuel bed that is the problem with a lot of these invasive plants, especially things like annual grasses. Um, just some pictures here if any of you have ever um, tried to hike through an area that's been infested with yellow star thistle or tenuity. 
um, is painful as <laughs> now, now in addition to you know it's the degrading the recreational value. Um, um, changing dune habitats, so things that are adapted to these um, dune habitats that are extremely dynamic, you're actually stabilizing those dunes, and that's not good for the animals that are adapted to that dynamic environment. Um, this is um, one of our favorites, Armando Donax took out this bridge in the Santa Ana River. Um, it's funny because Arundo was often planted for erosion control in theory, and it does grow into stream banks really well. The problem is it creates these huge root masses where there's actually not a lot of soil anymore, and the whole thing gets pulled away. The entire bank will fail, and this material will just come downstream. And for, um, for places along the coast, you can imagine the economic damage this would cause if you're trying to have sort of beach-based tourism. Big problem for us in Ventura, certainly in LA County, um, beach communities as well. So finally, fire. <laughs> That's what you guys were trying to talk about. So um, essentially, there's a couple of different things that primarily happen in terms of um, invasive species increasing fire risk. So they can damage healthy vegetation, healthy native vegetation, turning them into dead dry fuel, and also bee fuel themselves. Thinking about how, say, a hillside of chaparral, or um, certainly in a desert environment, you know, you have a lot of you have plants, and you have bare soil, or maybe mulch soil, not necessarily completely bare, but there's separation between the things that can burn. As soon as you fill all of that in with ryegrass or something, there's no separation anymore. And there's nothing to kind of stop those flames from moving through. Um, and then this is just a picture of, you know, again, all that dead tree died back in the Sierra. All of this has gone from being, you know, tree to being fuel. Um, so a couple of other things that happen, um, and this is some of the things that we really wanted to tackle when we started the Safe Landscapes program, um, was getting people to understand how their landscape fire preparation can actually kind of backfire on them because of these invasive plants. So um, over clearance, so, so you know, people come in, they, you do your rush clearance in what, May, June, what's usually the deadline here, May 15th? May. May, okay, I mean, different places, it varies a little bit depending on the, um, the moisture, some areas that get more of an ocean influence, it'll be a little bit later in the year. But everybody, you know, does their brush, brush clearance, gets your inspection, everything's good, but you've cleared out all the native vegetation. What's gonna grow back are the weeds. They're going to germinate in June, July, grow up through the summer, die back in August, and by the time the Santa Ana winds roll around, it's just the sea of dead thatch. Um, after the fires come through, again, you have that highly disturbed environment, naturally the native plants would come back on their own, but not if you have um, a lot of weedy, um, seed bank in there, or you just have a lot of um, weedy species around the periphery that are producing wind-blown seed that blow into those fire areas. Um, and finally, one of the you know big things that we did when we did the Safe Landscapes project that wasn't so much the outward-facing education that we did for homeowners, we worked a lot with fire departments as well as some, some of the large nurseries because they had lists of plants they were recommending for fire-resistant landscapes that were actually invasive. And one of the things we find, while there may be a few plants on that list that, yeah, you can make a decent argument that they are fire-resistant, wouldn't recommend them for, for these other reasons, some of them really aren't. So things like ice plant and vinca, a lot of these ground covers that come in, the real problem is you see this nice, um, succulent vegetation or leafy vegetation that's full of moisture on the surface and you think you're safe. What homeowners don't realize is that under that layer, there's a layer of dead thatch. And so a lot of times with ice plant, what firefighters see is it's really hard to find the hot spots because it's burning under the green mat on the top through all that dead 
thatch, and then it'll pop up where they're not expecting it. Okay, another issue um, um, is how invasive plants contribute to a um, ecological process called type conversion. So type conversion is when there's some kind of disturbance in a system, and for whatever reason, it doesn't it doesn't grow back to be the same um, kind of vegetation community it was before. It doesn't always involve invasive plants. So we have a lot of areas in the Santa Monicas where we seem to have um, um, reduced fire um, return intervals. And what's actually happening is that even though it's a native plant, you have a lot of, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name right now, some of the, like the laurel sumac and um, lemonade berry coming in and just creating a monoculture seed. So yes, they're native species, but they're still type converting that from a biodiverse um, mix of species to really a monoculture. More often, though, what we see is type conversion from something like, say, coastal sage to an exotic annual grassland. And that's what we see a lot of, again, because we have um, all of this weed seedbed in the soil. And this is something that's been happening you know, since we first started branching in Southern California. That's really when a lot of these seeds were brought in to increase the fodder value of a lot of our, especially the lowland, sort of flatter sloped areas. <clears throat> so again, natural fire cycles can be really beneficial. And I'm sure that Lily and some of the other speakers have talked about these amazingly beautiful fire followers and fire adapted plants. But the other thing that happens is even for sort of the less adapted plants, what's great about fire naturally is there's three things that plants really compete for, right? They compete for, um, well, two, I mean space has, but space has several elements. They compete for water and nutrients. And then they're competing for, competing for space and access to sunlight. And so fire comes in and gives some of those younger plants a chance to germinate and grow. So that can be a good thing. But again, when you have these invasives come in, you break the cycle and you create a new cycle like this. So invasive plants come in, high, high and continuous fuel beds, increase the fire frequency and severity, that eventually reduces the native seed bank and the population of re-sprouters, making those um, landscapes more prone to invasion. And so it becomes this really nasty cycle because even these great fire followers that need either fire or smoke to germinate, if there's not enough time in between fires for those plants to <clears throat> mature and set seed, you eventually burn out that seed bank. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm harping on some of the same things, but these are just some good examples in here. Um, I've talked about annual grasses, increasing fuel load and continuity. Um, the brooms are really good at doing the same thing on hillsides. So they really like fire disturbed um, environments, and then they, they just fill it in with the monoculture. We saw a lot of that after the station fire. Was Katie one of the speakers that you guys had? Katie and Zant? She's really good at some point in the future. She's a botanist with the Forest Service and has done a lot of volunteer um, uh, broom removal, which is really hard to do. They are deeply rooted plants. Um, but we saw that a lot. Um, there's a documented example in Catalina where broom came in and really, again, created those continuous fuel beds and then increased the severity of the next wildfire that came through. I talked about the ground covers harboring hotspots, um, and one of the things we see with our riparian invasives, like a rundo, salt cedar, um, tree tobacco, castor bean, you can find these other areas that they really, they do need some moisture, they like the riparian corridors. Um, with a rundo, it grows up, dies back, and then you, naturally our riparian areas ought to be a fuel break. They become fire conduits now because we have all of that really highly flammable material. Um, just to be fair, though, so <laughs> I'll point out some good things again about the relationship between fire and invasive plants. 
Fires provide an opportunity because you can come in. So one of the most expensive, if any of you guys have been involved with the restoration project, one of the most difficult and expensive challenges to removing invasive plants, especially larger, woodier plants like Arundo, is just how do you haul off biomass? Where do you put it? How do you dispose of it? It's a huge challenge. If you can go in and that's already been burned out and you can get a handle on it before it re-sprouts, you've actually saved yourself a lot of money and effort. And in there are some areas, we don't tend to see this because of our air quality issues in Southern California, but there are some areas where they actively use fire, prescribed fire, as a management tool, both for vegetation as a whole, but also specifically for invasive species. You can use it to get rid of them. We never got the permission from the Air Quality Management District to do that down here, but there you go. Um, <coughs> um, so yeah, it's really going in, treating re-sprouts, whether it's by me mechanical or by hand or with herbicides, that's again a different conversation we can have at some point. But these are some of the Arundo re-sprouts in a fire that was 2000 three or four in San Francisco Canyon. Put a date on that photo, sorry about that. I did really, I tried to do better than I usually do in the talk about crediting pictures that weren't mine, but the pictures that were mine just got thrown in there, so. Okay, um, I don't know if this has already been talked about sort of ad nauseum in this series, but just a reminder of what the kinds of things we were looking for in fire resistant landscapes. Ideally, you don't start by looking at the landscape. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do. They walk outside their house, and they look at the hill slope, and they think, I gotta clear that brush, and that'll keep me fire safe. What they don't do is turn around, look at their house, and their near home landscaping. Because resisting fire, for the most part, means resisting the incursion of embers. Almost all of our fires, the station fire was a huge exception, almost all of them are wind-driven fires. And it's not the direct flame impingement that goes from structure to structure, although we're certainly seeing on the Thomas fire, usually what spreads it into homes are the, are the embers flying in. So things like um, making sure you have a fire-resistant roof, and not only that you have the right roofing material, but that you're using it properly and you're sealing any areas where embers could get underneath. That's really important. Um, Fire-resistant walls, you know, um, double-pane windows are really important because you could have stuff flying around in a fire that breaks through your windows and brings the embers in no matter how good your roof is, right? Um, so these are some of the features of the house itself, making sure that decks are sealed. Simple things that aren't on here as well, like don't store your firewood next to your house. Don't try to have your propane tanks further away and don't put wood next to your propane tanks. Um, these kinds of things. Um, versus, you know, this house here with a flammable roof and really large windows facing the wild lambs and overhangs, which is where embers can get under and then stay trapped there and really have a chance to ignite the um, housing material itself. And then having all of this plant material, yes, right up and under the house. These, this is, you know, it doesn't say it here, but these could be Italian cypresses. They are the worst. I don't know who had the idea that these are something you should have next to your home. But most firefighters I've talked to call these Roman candles because that's what happens during an ember storm. They're perfect for trapping embers and people plant right next to their houses. Um, um, so, yeah, so really it's, and it's again, not no vegetation, and I will harp on this in the next few slides too, it's clumping your vegetation and having some breaks between those clumps of vegetation. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to get too into kind of the legal ramifications. I think you had somebody from the fire department who can talk about, who talked about that a little bit, but again, it's the general idea is Keeping things spread apart, especially keeping things low in the near home area, the lean, green, lean, clean, and green area, and you can also use some fire resistant, you know, um, rock mulches and have sort of uh, rock and concrete features in there. And then further out, you can have your larger trees, 
But what you're trying to make sure you don't have are fuel ladders. These are actually pictures of good. Um, so you, you don't want to have things where a fire along the ground can go straight up into the treetops and then you're creating the embers on your own property. Oh, here's the one about fuel letters, but I'm going to move a little bit quickly. Again, it's all just about keeping it, keeping space. Oh, same, similar picture once again, keeping everything well maintained. Um, but again, what you don't see is just nothing around here. It's all about the maintenance. So conducting reasonable what we call fire hazard reduction. I mentioned this before. You know, brush clearance, lousy term because it's not what we want you to do. And if you if that's what's done, you can create a, a sort of a secondary. You know, within the year, you actually create higher fuel beds by the time the fire risk is high. Um, and you're creating an erosion risk too, both all the time, but especially post fire, right? Where there's a lot of erosion risk. So this is what a lot of people do. Oops. What Marty uh, Witter calls donut. Hole. You don't want to be a moonscape because that's going to make you, yeah, it's fire resistant, but it does leave you prone to erosion. Um, and you don't want a donut hole. So that's what this is supposed to be. No donut holes. Um, <laughs> where you know, people clear all this vegetation down the slope, creating a huge erosion risk, but then they have all of this vegetation right under the eaves and right up to the home. This one in particular, like, makes no sense whatsoever. Um, just quickly thinking about, again, what to plant when you're, if you're replanting an area post-fire, what makes a plant fire resistance? You, you want things that um, store water in the leaves and stems, especially with limited watering. That's great. So you can use, you know, the same plants that are drought tolerant are fire resistant. The goal here is to make sure that you don't have to do a lot of maintenance to keep things fire resistant. So if you have this really lush landscape, it looks good when you're watering it, but then watering restrictions come around and you end up with all of this dead material. One of the things that I will not give you today is a plant list. And I will, not, I will, I will give you a plant list of things you shouldn't plant on the invasive species. But it won't give you a plant list of what you should plant. And that's because I want you to sort of think about these features as you're choosing plant materials. But I really find that people get a list in their hand, they buy those plants, they plant them, and they don't think about what's really important, which is the ongoing maintenance. Because any plant will burn under the right conditions. Any, well, except for the nice metal tree I saw at your fire station down in uh, <laughs> someone in Tax Road. I, I actually get to take a picture of that because somewhere I have a slide with, with a metal plant. Terrible. It's a metal oak down there. That is completely fire resistant. Doesn't provide a lot of habitat benefits. Um, things with um, open loose branches so that you can get in there and clean them out. Juniper's terrible, right? Because there's just, again, this dead thatch inside that nice green thing, and it sort of lulls you into, a, into complacency there. Um, just, sorry, just doing a time check on myself here. Um, things, um, you, you pretty much, and, and there's some variation in here, but you pretty much want to avoid a lot of volatile oils and resins. So, like, I, I wouldn't plant rosemary right up to your house. It's a fine thing to have in your drought-resistant landscape further away from your home, but maybe not right up and under the eaves, for example. Um, and again, you don't want things that are weedy and invasive because they're just going to get out of control. And if you have something that's a nice, deeply rooted plant, like a lot of the native plants that Theodore Payne grows and sells here, that's great too because then you're, they're doing double duty for you as fire-resistant and as erosion-resistant. But again, maintenance is more important than plant choice. Water cannot compensate for poor maintenance. And you shouldn't think about it that way. I mean, I'm not saying don't wet everything down before you evacuate under that kind of stress. But I am saying, in general, it's not a great solution. Because again, you get this dead thatch. Um, um, and 
And again, things that are slow growing and drought resistant, great, because you're going to put less resources in, make it easy for yourself. Find things that don't require a lot of uh, maintenance. If you do really want to plant most, there's a pretty good one that LA County puts out in their fuel modification plan. Um, but I'm not going to promise on this link because I just realized this is, these are old slides. I'm not positive that that works. I have to go back and look at it. I will give. Oh, whoops. Okay, I fixed it. Um, so these are just some examples of things that are highly flammable. And yes, some of these are natives. But again, it's things that are producing a lot of litter, that have a um, really sort of a dense growth form. I'm not saying don't plant them, but you might not want them really close to your house. Or if you do have them, you might want to have like a rocky mulch or some decomposed granite around them. Things like um, chemise or, or buckwheat. But it's really a lot of these other things that you think is out. The pompous grass, Italian cypress, um, a lot of the palms, the palms can be okay if they're maintained well, but a lot of people don't maintain them well. And you end up with some loose fronds. When a Santa Ana event comes by, if those things catch fire, again, you've got a flaming arrow that can knock your windows out and open your home to embers. Um, and then anything that's producing really a lot of litter, again, we've got the invasive example of, of blue gum. Um, and then the native example of red shanks, again, made a great plant, love it, but you might not want it right up next to your home. And you might not want to, if you do have it, you might want a specimen spaced apart, not necessarily a big old clump. And here's some really great examples. If you want to have a fire resistant um, um, garden that is all native, you absolutely can do that. There are wonderful native plants that fulfill sort of all of those features um, of not producing so much. The oaks are great, and, um, and the cherries are really good for tree choices. Um, um, if you, areas where you do want things that are a little bit denser, um, I don't know if the poverty weed is native here, really. Okay. Um, but again, it all depends on where on your landscape you're using them. So this is poverty weed, you know, growing along, I wish I had a, a pan out from that photo, growing along the driveway. Fine, you know, it's a little bit denser, that's a good place for something like that. Um, and if you want more about that, and I think, we, you know, we handed these out, there's some great lists. Um, there's some really good websites, and I do want to give sort of a shout out to the Plant Right website. That was really an effort between a lot of invasive plant um, activists. <laughs> That's not quite the term that I'm looking for. Um, but from biologists and community members who are really interested in making sure we didn't use invasive plants, working together with the horticulture industry. And the nice thing is you can go and say, you know, I want this growth form. And they're like, okay, well, don't use this one, use this one. So you can do it by color, you can do it by growth form. And you know, still have whatever the look is that you want, but you can just make some better choices about the individual specimens you're using to get there. Okay, a little bit shifting gears here now. I want to talk about invasive pests. Um, so um, some of the issues, well, some of the issues are the same, except that. We don't have a whole lot of things that we've introduced in terms of insect species just because we wanted them there, but they're not invasive. The way we did with the plants. Um, so generally, it's, it's more you know, just focusing on the things that are problems. Um, except for the cases that we actually are bringing in other insects to be biocontrol for the first insect. So we have some of that, or biocontrol for some of the invasive weeds, so there's a, there's a good biocontrol agent now developed for cameras, for example. So this is a global problem. We have just seen this explosion of invasive pests causing massive problems all over the world. It's not completely new. You know, we have Dutch elm disease and chestnut blight come through in the past and really change our, especially our urban and suburban, you know, landscapes. Um, throughout the country, but we're just seeing this influx now from sort of all sides. And a lot of this may have to do with climate change and making the conditions more amenable to some of these species, but a lot of it also has to do with just transportation, right? 
all of this focus on free trade and globalism means that we're getting products from all over the world. And insects can come in with those products or with the packaging material for those products. So we know there's been a lot of wood um, boring beetle introductions in wooden crate materials. Are there laws to prohibit that? Sure. Are laws always enforced in international shipping? No. So, you know, laws are not going to be all and all without some kind of enforcement capacity. Um, and then simply just land use changes, bringing a lot of these disturbed environments out to, to habitat. Um, some of the impacts that invasive pests can have, not just, you know, yes, we're seeing these individual trees die off, but we're seeing changes not just in the species composition, but in like the physical structure of our vegetation communities, right? We talk a lot about, um, um, you know, understory versus canopy and all that, and so you might be losing age diversity because of pests, and you might be losing um, structural diversity because of pests. Um, you end up with loss of wildlife habitat. I mean, you know, snags are great, but this is a little overboard, right? We don't need that many snags. Um, you see the loss of physical structure, and so this is the kind of thing that I'm really concerned about in riparian areas. We're losing a lot of our riparian trees, and I'll get to that in a minute. They're being replaced by things like a rondo. If you think about a willow with this nice, broad, branching growth form, you're shading the creek, right, with a willow. When you think, when you replace it with a cane that's just straight up and down, you've lost all of that shading. And that has implications for water temperature. It has implications for what we call cover and sort of protection from visual predators that all impact aquatic species. Um, and then there's, you know, just the loss of amenity and property value. And we lose those native plants, and what comes back? The weeds. So there's a relationship between the invasive pests and the invasive plants. Some of the issues that we're dealing with right now in California and the Sierra, and, and not just in the Sierra, but anywhere where we have coniferous forests, we're facing a lot of bark beetle issues, so mountain pine bark beetle and others, so big bear, like arrowhead down here, as well as up along the Sierra, where we sort of think about the magnitude of those problems. Um, we have diseases like sudden oak death not affecting us down here as of yet, but we actually saw a huge increase in sudden oak death this year in Monterey, and I think in maybe even into San Luis Obispo more. We just we just did our annual um, um, sod blitz where volunteers actually went out and monitored it, and they saw a really big uptick after we've seen several years of things not really expanding as fast as we thought they might. Um, and then the two species that I'll talk about a little bit more that I work more intimately with, gold spotted oak borer and it really should say invasive shot hole borers here and I'll talk about why now. Just briefly talking about gold spotted oak borer, um, this is a pest that we just recently found in LA County. It's not in this area yet although we appreciate people keeping an eye on their oaks to see if they see any signs of it. Um, and I'll tell you what the signs are in just a second. Um, but it's in the, um, uh, the Green Valley area up kind of near um, Agua Dulce, up above that part of the county now. So this is a boring beetle. It is a, it is a um, bark beetle. It's found under the bark. Um, it's actually an interesting example when you think about invasive species because it's a U.S. native. It is a native species in Arizona. It's not native to California. And so there's a lot of questions about, well, what's invasion and what's range expansion? And unfortunately, that makes the regulatory, trying to control these from a regulatory aspect really challenging because USDA doesn't really recognize this as an invasive pest, so they won't have the resources towards it that they do with some other pests. So it's been a little bit difficult. One kind of good thing, I guess, you could say about folks about it before, it prefers um, mature trees, which means that we have a window of time to solve this problem because we can go into an area where oaks have been devastated, 
and we can replant acorns and know that for at least the next, you know, six, seven, ten years, depending on the conditions and how the growth rate, they probably will do okay, and that gives us a little time to maybe figure out other solutions. Um, I don't have a great picture of it here, unfortunately, but they usually have a really distinctive D is shape to the entry hole. It's a fairly large entry hole. Um, you get this red staining in the bark underneath. Um, sometimes you'll see a lot of um, insect holes as well because woodpeckers will go after these guys. So you can see that. But it's the smaller holes that are really the sign of these guys. And they're relatively big. I mean, they're like half an inch long. So you might actually see this beetle and you might see the larvae. Um, it's caused the loss of tens of thousands of trees, particularly in like the Julian um, Mount Palomar areas of San Diego County, and then it moved up to Riverside, to Idlewild, and then it more recently was found in, um, um, trying to remember the name of the canyon in Orange County. Uh, <coughs> to the where? What? You wrote about where, then? Oh, I did. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot my own slides. Okay. I have not slept a lot in the last two weeks, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about there. Um, um, but we are seeing it. I, I'm not saying that we've seen the death of 3,000 trees yet in Green Valley, um, but we have seen about 3,000 effective, and there's several hundred that have been removed so far. Uh, causes crown thinning. Twig and branch die back, leaf loss, and then eventually just failure of the tree entirely. But a lot of times we'll come in and remove that tree, um, not just because it becomes a hazard, but also because it becomes a source to spread the infestation to surrounding trees. Uh, this is just a, where it is, just a blow up of that um, from uh, January um, of last year. This is the beetle that I'm actually spending most of my time on that we are seeing all over Southern California and certainly throughout Los Angeles County right now. Um, this is actually two beetles. So we're, we're really trying to shift over to the term invasive shop borers from polyphagous shop borer. Um, does anybody know what polyphagous means? Eats everything. Eats everything. Eats everything. Yeah, it's completely wrong. It does not eat everything. <coughs> it eats like two things. So these guys are ambrosia beetles. What they do is they drill a gallery into a tree. They're not bark beetles. Bark beetles tend to be just under the bark in the active growth area. These guys aren't really concerned about what the tree is doing. It's just structure for them. And it is providing some moisture. So they drill this gallery into the heartwood, and then they inoculate it with a fungal component. And it's Primarily this fusarium fungus that seems to be the problem and is predominant, but there's actually three or four other fungal species. It's a whole little community that they bring with them. And they farm it in there, and that's what they eat. Unfortunately, these guys will create those galleries potentially in over 200 species of trees. So that's where the polyphagus comes in. Um, it should be poly, I don't know, poly. <laughs> Something, I don't know. Yeah, well, no, it's, not, it's the phagus part that's off. Um, okay, the other tricky thing about these is just to... God, I hate these guys. Um, they sit mate. So they drill these galleries, the female inoculates it with the fungus, fungus grows up, eat the fungus, lay their eggs, the larvae eat the fungus. The larvae go through their entire life cycle inside that gallery, to sexual maturity, and then they mate with their siblings. So the beetles that emerge are already um, pregnant. They already have fertilized eggs, and they go on and establish their own galleries. This is a huge problem, because whatever you sort of feel about pesticides and insecticides, our most effective insecticides in this day and age are things that are mimicking um, pheromones. We, they're not looking for mates, so we can't attract them to something that smells like a mate. So it takes that whole toolkit off the table for us. Um, yeah, and then anyway, the death comes from both the holes themselves. There can be secondary infections because now the whole the tree is like sort of Swiss cheesed, 
in addition to the fungus itself walking on the xylem. Um, the holes are very small, so if you are, if you think you have this species and you would like to confirm it, so I'll tell you this, we are overwhelmed right now in our response to this. For better or worse, if you live here, we don't necessarily want to know if your tree is infested. <laughs> if you think it is, our answer is probably going to be probably yes. We, we, no, we don't really need a sample right now because it's just, I mean, the lab cannot handle anymore. So if you really want to know if your tree is infested because of management actions you're thinking about taking, there are ways you can submit a sample. Um, but the first thing you can do is you can send me a picture. And I will look at that picture and I have a team of trained, actually master gardeners who are working with me on this a little. We're starting to get there where they can look at that picture too and do kind of a first pass assessment. If you're going to send me a picture, send it with a ballpoint pen in it because one of the really distinctive features of these guys is the size and the perfect roundness of the entry holes. Um, there is actually a native beetle, western oak bark beetle, that makes even a smaller hole. So it's not just anything small or it's really that it's the size of it. So, so it's really helpful to have something in any photos for scale. You'll usually see kind of an oily, dark stain surrounding the entry holes, discolored wood. Um, so because there's so many different trees that this affects, though, it's hard to describe exactly what the symptoms are that are distinctive or diagnostic for this pest. Um, and so um, on some trees, you'll see the sugar volcano. On others, you'll see staining. I'm going to show you in the next slide some other symptoms that you might see. But the other thing is it's hard to say whether you're going to see branch dieback or stem dieback because on some species, it likes to attack the main stem. On others, it much prefers the secondary branches. Primarily on oaks, it attacks the secondary branches first. On sycamores and willows, it seems to like the main trunk first. Probably because the bark is, you, know, you don't have the same buildup of, of bark. Um, so these just some pictures of different kinds of staining, different kinds of things. What you often will see, especially during active flight periods in the spring, is um, the females actually, they'll dig a hole and then they'll like, they'll lay their eggs and then they'll hang out there with their butts hanging out. <laughs> so sometimes you'll actually see the beetles themselves, but not usually, and you don't usually see them flying around. And they are really small. I think I did have a picture. I didn't take out the slide of the picture earlier. Really. Yeah, so that, that was for them on a dime. They're really small little beetles. There's a lot of other things that look like them. Um, so it's really the, the um, signs of infestation that will help us a little bit more. So this, I believe this is a liquid amber. So they tend to be a sticky, sappy kind of tree. So they'll produce this kind of response. On avocado, which have a high sugar content, you'll see the sugar volcano. But there's just really a lot of variation. A lot, I think, several of these are different kinds of sycamores, where you can really see the staining very well. Um, <coughs> it's important because it will, it does affect some agricultural crops, predominantly avocado. Although we haven't seen the massive dieback in avocado that the state and the avocado commission and the avocado growers feared. So avocados seem to be somewhat resistant, especially if there are more preferred hosts around. Um, but um, I want to thank the avocado commission because almost all of the research I'm talking about today was funded by them. I'm just starting to see that though. I do actually have funding for my work from the Forest Service, so I'll thank them as well. But a lot of the research was funded by the avocado commission. Very recently, in a controlled study in a um, scientific greenhouse, we also saw that the fusarium fungus can affect almond. We have not seen an infestation on almond anywhere, but it's possible. So we're, we're again, this interest from the agricultural community may rise up again if that happens. Huge concern for urban forests. There's, there's at least a good 40 really commonly planted street trees that this will affect, um, and a huge concern for native forests because essentially these guys affect all our native riparian trees. 
I know I veered really far from fire here, so just for a moment, let me remind you, riparian zones naturally should be our fire breaks. If they're full of dead trees, they become fire conduits. Um, just a little history here. We first found the past in 2003 in Whittier Narrows, although it was misidentified. Um, we realized that it was a new thing and a problem um, when it killed a street full of box elders in Long Beach. We started to find it on avocados. And then the crazy thing is this other species, almost identical other species of beetle with its own very similar but different fungal component showed up in San Diego in 2013. So there are two species now, Polyphagus shovelhor and Kuroshio shovelhor, um, both in the same genus, both new to science, um, or I mean, new to us knowing about them. They've been around a while, I'm sure. Um, and um, both with very similar host range and very similar problems. So we're trying to just shift everybody over to ISHB now. I wish we had like the really good name that GSOB has because that's just like very evocative, you know. Although that one's in the past. Um, so we're seeing this thing spread now. It's throughout LA County. It's down into Orange and San Diego and actually it's, it's across the border into Mexico. Um, and we're working with Mexican colleagues right now. Um, and then up into Santa Paula, Thousand Oaks. Um, and then we actually found it in Montecito. Um, and it was found once, and we're still, but so far it hasn't taken hold in Santa Cruz. So we're still trying to figure that one out. So just showing you the map of this progression. Um, this is pretty much the current distribution. Um, yellow is where we have traps, but we haven't found it yet. Thankfully, red is where we found Polyphica shuttle or blue is where we found Crochio shuttle or. This is, I don't expect you to be able to read this, there will not be a quiz on this, but this is the list of confirmed, actually this is out of date, it's higher now. Um, this is back from June, so of course it's changed since then. Um, the list of known reproductive hosts, and one thing that I want to make clear about this list, um, there's no reason to think that the 200 some odd species of trees that we know are susceptible to the fusarium won't be added to this list in the future. So you can't sort of plant your way out of this one by just avoiding all the trees on this list. This will grow. We've added two or three confirmed species every year. The reason it went, I, I forgot to mention this, but the reason that the list was so high right from the beginning is one of the first places we found this thing was in Huntington Botanical Gardens. So it had 200 some odd species of tree to taste mm -hmm. and try out. And then it was, it's also throughout the LA County Arboretum. Um, there's avocado up there. So these are the native hosts. And again, I don't expect you to read this either, but just know that it is most of our native oaks and all of our native riparian um, willows, poplars, um, our sycamores. Cottonwoods, yeah, it's all in there. Even some smaller species like mule fat. Is Toyon on that? I don't like it. Uh, no, I don't think Toyon is a confirmed reproductive host at this point. I do think it's on the long, larger list. I noticed it the last list. Was it on there? Okay. Oh, ah. Coyote brush was on as well. Yeah, yeah. I was really focusing on the riparian yeah. plants. I, am I going to have to do something more complicated here? That's okay. We're just yeah, do this. Oh. A quick review. Pomegranates and persimmons been confirmed. Uh, pomegranates, yes. I would have to look back, I think, for Simmons as well. Unfortunately, and that's the other thing, this list is this list is the order in which somebody sent a sample to Akeith Eskel and our fabulous plant pathologist at UC Riverside. It's not alphabetical. It's not group taxonomically. <laughs> it is just the order in which they were confirmed. Because so far, we haven't been able to do we could do either of those other two things, but it's a little misleading. Um, and we really haven't had the time to do a severity ranking. 
You will see, I mean, nicely, there's a few things on here like tamarisk. It does like tamarisk, it does like Atlantis, it loves castor bean. Yeah. yeah, see, you want to say yay until you think about the fact that we have this uncontrolled growth of castor bean along tons of our roadways connecting healthy native populations of, of native plants. So, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is a little tough, but it becomes sort of a conduit to spread this thing around. And is any plant susceptible or only ones that are being taxed by lack of water? Oh, ah, uh, so, good question. We have no idea yet, you know, where this will stop. Um, <coughs> that is a very active field of research, is to figure out by species, if there's anything that seems to concur resistance, but also, we have found populations of the same species where one tree is attacked and another isn't. And one of the things that we're looking at primarily right now for control is seeing whether there's something, really the most sort of um, interesting field of research right now is, is there's something about the bacterial community. It's all that microbiome stuff, right? There's something about the bacterial or fungal community on that tree that seems to be conferring resistance because if we can find, it's primarily bacteria that they're looking at right now, bacteria, native bacteria that confer resistance, we can develop a product and a spray and we can inoculate other trees with that. It's like probiotics for trees. Because um, it's really the fungus that is the worry, not the little bug. You know, it's, it, First off, they're always together. You can't have a population of this bug because they eat the fungus. They won't exist without the fungus. We haven't seen any spread of the fungus without the beetle. In you know, theory, that could happen with like equipment or something like that. Um, but there are occasions where it, the trees are just so riddled with holes that the physical damage is significant. So we think it's you know we think of the fungus as the pathogen, but branch failures during windstorms have happened where it's just that it's, again, it's like a perforated tree. Insecticide is an, is a, an answer because so the, they're inside the tree. Well, so there are a couple of other active fields of research are um, uh, using insecticides. There's been some good results with the metacloprid. Um, I am not an insecticide or a pesticide expert. And I'm not um, licensed to make any recommendations about any products, but we do have, and I should have brought it with me today, um, a pest note from UCANR that does talk about some of the products that have been effective. There's also um, a couple companies, Manger and Arborjet, who are looking at um, 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 things that you um, inject into the tree, injectables, so it can get inside. But honestly, the companies have said they found a, real, a lot of really good um, results with that, but the researchers have not found the same results, so it hasn't been borne out. So we'll see. The final thing, though, I mean, for me, I'm primarily, I know you guys are primarily maybe thinking about this as homeowners or urban forest advocates. I'm thinking about wildlands, and it's just never going to be cost effective. It's just too expensive. Um, aside from all of the knock-on environmental impacts of the chemicals themselves. Yeah. Um, what can you do about this? And I'm almost done, and I will uh, take questions then. I, boy, I talked a lot longer than I thought I would, but we did start with it. So. Um, what can you do? So, it's, this seems small. We do have a number of handouts. If you do think you have this tree, and I sh should have had another slide in here, but essentially, um, Removing infested wood is the best way right now to control the spread of this population. And removal means taking down those branches and then chipping them to one inch minus, which basically means tub grinding them. So it's still a pretty expensive prospect. Um, I've gone out to people's out, you know, backyards with our plant pathologist, and he's like, yeah, you want to chip it and you want to keep all those chips on, your, you know, on site. And people are like, I have a quarter acre lot and a high fire hazard, so I'm not keeping all the mulch on site. So this is a huge issue right now. What do we do with all this plant material? And is the stuff being spread by not treated green waste? I would be very careful if you're planning to get mulch. 
to know where it comes from, and ideally it's small. Now unfortunately, the smaller the mulch, the more concern there is about fire. So the fire department likes the larger mulch. For the past, you want smaller mulch. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's a balancing act. Um, it's really tricky. Um, you can solarize the wood material, and certainly on some, several species of trees, like oaks, you can remove an infested branch and have done well by a certified arborist and a good tree removal company, and they don't do a half job. And there's some chance for that um, wound to seal and heal up you may be able to save the rest of the tree. And we have seen some really effective um, treatments that way. We only have so it's hard for me to say this works because we've only had like six years. That's not a long time in the life of a tree. But we have seen areas where we've been able to slow the spread um, and save some trees, at least in the short term. We just don't know about the long term yet by doing that. But in general, some things that can be done at a community level are making sure that wood just isn't being moved around. This could, same thing for the gold spotted oak borer. We think that the reason that it made that leap from San Diego to Idlewild was a camper. You know, somebody taking some firewood they bought in San Diego, maybe, maybe they didn't buy it, maybe they cut it, maybe it was their friends, whatever, and hauling it up to I don't know. So if you want to have firewood, the firewood needs to be solarized or um, some other form of heat treatment so that it uh, so that it's properly seasoned. Or you know, if you're in an infested zone and you take down a tree and you want to burn it in your fireplace, that's fine. You're not going to be spreading the infestation. <coughs> um, more information at pshp.org. We're actually overhauling the site right now to make it a little more user friendly, but all of this information is on there. There's a whole series of handouts that kind of take you through what, when to decide to remove a tree, when to even send us a sample, um, um, how to treat the wood um, that you take down. So it's all on there. And again, I should have had on here, and I, oh man, this is bad. I'd be mad if he did this. Escalinlab.org, which is linked here. So. A lot of this research was, again, done by Keith Eskelin and Richard Stouthammer at UC Riverside, our Elm Extension colleagues out there. Um, oh, and that was my last slide, so there you go. So I'm ready for questions. So would you please repeat the questions? Sure. Yes, I can do that. Yeah. So how does all the, well, how do all these recent fires and just fire ecology affect the spread of these different invasive pests and I'm sure it's different between the like bark beetles and maybe like something else that can fly or move. Yes, well okay and I should say both of these beetles can fly okay, and in fly. fact the um, uh, the chocolate wars in theory could move on their own like six miles a year under really excellent conditions for them. We haven't seen that happening, we don't believe. Um, and they like don't fly if they don't have to. They'll, in fact, a lot of times they'll emerge and they'll form a new gallery in the same tree, um, the offspring um, coming out of their, their mother gallery. Um, we don't know yet. There was actually something else, so I'm sorry, that somebody brought up that I forgot to address about drought. Um, um, stress trees. So usually we say that drought stress trees are more prone to insect problems. We're not necessarily seeing that with these pests because they are seeking out trees with a high enough moisture content to support fungal growth. So they really like, that's why they like riparian trees, and in landscapes, they really like well-irrigated, sometimes over-irrigated trees. It's a good reason to make sure sycamores in, you know, the sort of grassy recreational park are not over-irrigated. Um, so, but I, I, I don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, we just have this past. We're just starting to have these large fires. It's a great question. 
and we'll be doing more research. It's, it's so far I've looked more at the one side of what I'm sure is a cycle. We know the insect pests may be increasing fire risk and increasing fuel loads. I'll just go around. So I have a question you know, rules. Rules. Oh, I will try. <laughs> um, I it has been impressed on me that we're not allowed to bother uh, the things that are growing in the forest that's near my house. Mm -hmm. And I take my dog down the fire ropes a lot. And there's a lot of mustard growing there. Would I get in trouble for pulling out the mustard? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, would, are you allowed to pull invasive weeds on public property or property that is not your own? I would say the answer to that off the cuff is no, but we have had a lot of great volunteer involvement in invasive weed control programs. So what I would do is try to hook up maybe through your HOA with whoever is the landowner. So is it National Forest? Or uh -huh. it's, it's Angeles Forest. Um, I would contact them and see it, and, and I'm trying to think of who to contact, whether it's still Shannon's, what? She's Cable Canyon. That's County. Yeah. Oh, that's County, yeah, yeah. So I would talk to Jay Lopez there. Are you, in, are you part of a fire safe council? No. Okay. I'm, I'd have to go to Jay, back to Jay. He was one of the speakers in the series, right? Um, he's probably a little busy right now. But in a few weeks, uh, hopefully, um, and find out if there's a local fire safe council, or you can go, you can do a Google search for California Fire Safe Council, which is the statewide sort of organization of fire safe councils, and they have links to all the local ones. See if you can get involved with them, and then see if you can get a perm, if they already have a permit or a program in place. And once you get involved with that, then it may be that you don't necessarily have to go out on set days. And if you want to just pull mustard, you can. Okay. Um, Since it's fire ropes, can I ask at the fire station? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know who controls the setbacks in any particular location. Mm -hmm. um, but is, so the land is county, is county open space, or it's still okay. Angeles Forest? It's in the county, not in the city. It's in the county, it's in the county not the city, but it, if it's the forest, forest service, service, Angeles, yeah. Angeles Forest, <coughs> the San Gabriel Mountains. Yeah. I called the Arcadia headquarters for the English Forest and asked who they have overseen that kind of thing. You could try to contact Katie Vinzant. She's the botanist with Angeles Forest. She's been doing a lot of work, I know, in the Santa Clara Ranger District. You're on the LA River Ranger District. But she might know who is working on invasive plants there. Or she may be involved in that, too. And I know she's got a whole volunteer corps. So it may just be a matter of sort of officially enrolling as a volunteer, and then you can. Going on the other hand, I'm going to get I don't think anybody would stop. Yeah, They're not exactly. I was just going to say, I don't think anybody will stop. Yeah, yet. I mean, that's so. what I was thinking of just asking the fire department if they would be the people who would be wandering just, around there. Yeah. And yeah. If they say it's okay, I don't think anybody's going to stop you. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go here first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it seems like the, most of the research is on insecticides for dealing with the beetles. Is there any research on substances that were trapped in the hole? So, um, the, uh, let me repeat the question there. The question was, what kind of research is going on on controlling um, the beetles that I was talking about? And is there research on some kind of like a physical barrier that would trap them inside the galleries? There is. We've tried a few things, and they have chewed through everything that has been tried so far. They are, like, it's crazy. So uh, one of the things that was tried, and really now, because it didn't work, we're using it as a study mechanism, is um, just latex paint. And, and say things like Vaseline that are nasty, you can eat through that or? They seem to be able to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, I, I wouldn't say that all the research is on what I would call exactly insecticides. There's a lot of research going on on biocontrol agents. And, 
poor Keith and Richard keep having to go to Vietnam to look for these biocontrol agents um, and eat really good food. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're, so in addition to looking at the, um, the bacterial components that I mentioned before, they're also looking at um, uh, what's called a parasitoid wasp. These are tiny little wasps that will actually affect the larvae. And they found a few things that might look hopeful. Unfortunately, whenever you're going to use a biological agent for control, you have to make sure it's not going to have ill effects, that it's only going to affect the species that you want. And that takes like five to 15 years of testing. So they're working on it right now at Riverside. Um, it'll be a while. Um, so, yeah. 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 So. Just at the beginning of your talk, it sounded like, and you just went over this quickly, so I might not have understood. They were saying um, you don't advocate leaving it open just for natural regrowth. Um, what I was really saying, so so one of the things that um, Lily had said, and the question was whether I advocate sort of just letting nature take its course in burned areas and letting it recover on its own. What I was saying is um, that sometimes you have both the opportunity and it's really important to get in and control invasive weeds as well. I'm very suspicious, cautious, sometimes it is necessary, of efforts to actually replant, especially outside of our forest areas and our, and our chaparral slopes. Um, usually that's both not effective and um, not needed. Um, so I guess let me take a step back and say, I'm not, not in favor of letting nature take its course. I'm in favor of monitoring what's happening and seeing whether nature is able to do it on her own or whether we need some interventions like controlling invasive weeds. Does that yeah, make more sense? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Maybe you said you said the beginning, but do we think that like dead, dead trees from the beetles are contributing to the Thomas fire? So, um, I am not a coniferous forest ecologist. Um, I do tend to work, I, do, I have worked on these plants. Um, I would not say that there's good evidence right now that shockle borer is um, having an impact one way or the other on the Thomas fire. We do have a lot of dead willows and dead vegetation, especially in the Santa Clara River right now, um, as well as um, in the San Gabriel and the LA, you know, but in the Thomas Fire area. So far, we haven't seen fire coming down into those areas. I know that there was some burn from the Creek Fire at Hanson Dam, but I don't know exactly what burned there. Um, I do think that when you get into the higher elevations where there's more coniferous trees, there is an impact of, um, of the bark beetles. But don't hold me on that, I can't quantify it. It's definitely something that's being implicated in the amount of, um, I guess I should say how quickly the fire spread in the wine country region, where they did have trees that were dead due to sudden oak death, hardwoods, as well as bark beetles. But I'm not really the researcher working on that, so. I know it's sort of related to that. When you're just driving down the community and there's a completely dead tree in somebody's yard, um, is that something that, that should get reported somehow so in case it is, is invasively then spreading things to other trees in the area so you then have a wide swath of dead trees in the, in the, in the patch? I would say yes, but it's hard to know kind of who to report it to. Um, so there's a couple things going on. And in any decision to remove a tree, you need to consider all kinds of hazards. But it's primarily, you know, in these dense, dense areas like we have here, and even denser as you go more into the city, um, I'd say the risk is really hazard to the property owner's own property, but also to roadways and neighboring, you know, pedestrians and cars and all of that stuff. Um, I, 
Do you know, I'm not a homeowner. I don't know who you. LA County Act Commission. Uh, okay. Yeah, they're a little slammed though, but you can certainly try to report it to them. Um, you could also maybe talk to the folks at the local fire station, especially if you're in the high fire hazard severity zone. And having a visit from some uniformed fire personnel might be more effective. I don't know that the ad commissioner is has the manpower right now, or person power, I should say, to come out and take a lot of action. So it's a tough, it is a tough situation right now. But certainly in these fire hazard severity zones, I would think about talking to either county fire, either the local fire station, or somebody like Jay. People tend to be a little more receptive to that. Um, okay. Um, oh, um, one last question, then I've got to find out if my where my kid is. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you could just like talk a little bit more about selective thinning and the tension between um, fire suppression, the idea of like we should leave our wildlands untouched, and. So, okay, the question was if I could talk a little bit more about an issue that I'm going to say is not super relevant to, you know, this area or the Latina um, fire story or any of our current fires right now. Um, the issue of sort of fire suppression and selective thinning. My take on it is there is no untouched wildland. Okay, so things are being impacted by invasive species that were introduced by humans, they're being impacted by human-caused climate change, and they're being impacted, this is something we see a lot here that people don't sort of take into account, is um, nitrogen deposition and all of the air quality um, issues. So we basically see, along, there was a researcher out at Riverside, Edie Allen, who did a lot of work on this, and along like sort of the uh, Riverside corridor as you drive, you know, east on the 210, she went up to those hillsides and she found levels of nitrogen deposition similar to what you would apply to an ag field if you were intending to fertilize it. So there's very little that is nature left in California, to be perfectly honest. So I believe that we, it, again, it's a little tough, it's not my area of expertise like geographically, but, um, I kind of defer to my colleagues and think that, yeah, especially in the areas where we're seeing this drought and bark beetle related dieback, we should be doing removal of those dead trees and doing selective thinning. I do know that not all of my colleagues and not all fire ecologists would agree. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank Oh, yeah. Um, oh, that's shoot. I don't have a really good picture of the traps here. Um, so, 